This is a story of my third great-grandfather, William Slight, who was the chief engraver and draftsman for the Crown Lands Department of Victoria prior to his death in 1887. The story begins in the southeastern counties of Scotland, which are indicated here by a red rectangle. The ancestors of both William and his wife appear to have lived in this area from the time of my earliest records in the 1600s until towards 1850. The life of William's future wife began in 1830, when she and her twin brother were born on the estate of the Earl of Hopetown at Coupar in Fife. Her father John Moore was employed there as a gardener. The Earl's mother's married name was Louisa Dorothea Hope, and she had ten sons but no daughters. Apparently she approved of my third great-grandmother being christened using her names, as Louisa Dorothea Hope Moore. The 1841 census records Louisa, aged 10, living at nearby Monomail with her parents and four siblings. This is a photo of Louisa in later life. William's beginning is less clear because no christening records have been found for him or his siblings, nor a marriage record for their parents. However, the 1841 census records him living at Haddington in East Lothian, aged nine, with his parents James and Elizabeth. His mother had been christened in Haddington in 1796, and both William's father and maternal grandfather were Masons by trade. So it seems likely that the family were local to Haddington. No death records have been found for his parents, but William appears to have been orphaned at a young age. This is a photo of William as a young man, and this is another of him in later life. By the time of the 1851 census, Louisa is living at Edinburgh St Cuthbert, where she is a kitchen maid in the household of Lord Fullerton. I assume that she met William in Edinburgh, even though I have no direct evidence for him being there. The circumstantial evidence that he had a connection to Edinburgh is that his sister Susan married at Edinburgh St Cuthbert in 1852, his future landlord married at Edinburgh St Cuthbert in 1839, and he is more likely to have learned a trade of map engraving in Edinburgh than in Haddington. Besides, how else would he have met Louisa? Sometime around 1850, William moved to Southampton. The reason for this move seems to have been triggered by the Ordnance Survey moving from the Tower of London to Southampton in 1841. Until then, the Ordnance Survey had been outsourcing the engraving of its maps for Scotland to several companies in Edinburgh. With a new office in Southampton, that work was brought in-house, and I suspect William followed the work south. For the 1851 census, he is lodging with the family of Thomas MacLeod, another map engraver from Edinburgh, and there is a third Scottish map engraver named David Law also lodging there. In 1852, William married Louisa, who must have followed him south, at South Stoneham near Southampton. Their marriage certificate confirms that William is the son of a mason, and that Louisa is the daughter of John Moore, a gardener. In 1853, their first child was born. They named her Elizabeth, and she was to become my second great-grandmother. The family of three did not stay long in Southampton, and in late 1854, they boarded the Shand at Plymouth, headed for Victoria. Surprisingly, the passenger list says that William is a mason, instead of a map engraver. He may have been contemplating a career change, but I think given the occupation of his father may have been easier than trying to explain what a map engraver did. The voyage from Plymouth to Portland took just under three months, and on arrival William was part of a committee that raised £10 for the ship's captain and placed a newspaper advertisement thanking him, so presumably it went smoothly. I won't speculate about how my third great-grandparents celebrated landfall in Portland, other than to note that nine months to the day later, their second child and first son James was born at Ashby, a suburb of Geelong. By 1857, when their third child, William, was born, the family were living at Emerald Hill, which is now part of South Melbourne. 
Their final three children were born at Emerald Hill in 1861, 1863 and 1867. We can see all six children in this photo. Elizabeth, my second great-grandmother. James, who we will talk some more about shortly. William, Alexander, Susan and Louisa. Throughout this time, William continued to work as a map engraver and his work was starting to become highly acclaimed. In 1874, my second great-grandfather, Robert John Stephen Sellers, appears in Melbourne. He was born to Scottish parents at Albany in New York State and he lived for a time in Columbia, South America, where his father was a shipbuilding manager to the Panama Railway Company. After losing his parents at a young age, he was brought up by his aunt and grandmother in Glasgow before becoming an apprentice seaman. After leaving the sea, he seems to have settled into a job as a draftsman with William. About the same time, William's son James, known as Jim, began a sporting career, playing cricket for Victoria and football for South Melbourne, where he has been described as one of the early stars. Even though the house where Jim grew up no longer exists, it was across the road from what is now the Grand Prix track at Albert Park. Some disruption to the seemingly idyllic family life of the Slights seems to have taken root from about 1878, when my second great-grandparents, Elizabeth and Robert, were married. By 1879, they had moved to Adelaide in South Australia, and William's two younger sons had done the same. Also by 1879, Jim appears to have given up playing football to become an umpire. He must have been good at that too, because he was given charge of the first ever intercolonial football match between South Australia and Victoria. Later that year, the first issue of Continental Australia, the best known map of William Slight, was released. This is the map that you have been seeing in the background of this and some previous slides. It ran to four editions over 10 years and was exhibited around the world to help sell Victorian and Australian mining opportunities. The history of that map has been written about by Tom Darrow in a highly detailed article entitled This Beautiful Work of Art, Skeen and Slight's Continental Australia. The highlight of Jim's sporting career came in 1880 when he toured England with the Australian cricket team. He was awarded Test Cap number 24 in the first Test match ever played on English soil at the Oval. This is him photographed in Paris while on that tour, and he was described as a dashing batsman. In the test match, he started with a respectable 11 runs in a low Australian score. But in the second innings, he was out first ball for a golden duck. The man who claimed that wicket was none other than Dr WG Grace. In 1883, Louisa died aged 53, and four years later William died too, I think aged 56 or 57. Their two youngest daughters were not yet married, and William left each of them £200 sterling in his will, which they were to receive when they married, but only on the proviso that their husbands were of the Protestant faith. The will which was written shortly after Louisa's death makes no mention of my second great-grandmother, Elizabeth, and Jim signed an affidavit to say that only five of William's children were beneficiaries. Clearly Elizabeth must have had a major falling out with her father, and perhaps her eldest brother too. Louisa and William were buried in the Presbyterian section of the St Kilda Cemetery. After his father died, Jim, who had been trained as a map engraver by William, was his successor, and he went on to engrave many maps too. Jim and his wife Lila had four children, but two of their three sons died in infancy. Jim's remaining son, William Ralph Slight, spent three years in the Australian Imperial Force during World War I as a driver, mostly in France, and he married while in England. As far as I know, William Ralph had only one child, a daughter. William Ralph's occupation before the war was labourer and afterwards he became a carpenter, so he did not carry on the map engraving tradition. Jim died in 1930 at Elstonwick, aged 75, and he was buried in the same grave as his father and two young sons. 
This left William Ralph as the last descendant of William Slight to bear the Slight surname, because William's second son, his namesake William, had three daughters and no sons, and his youngest son Alexander had no children. When William Ralph Slight died in 1950, not only did the map engraving, sporting and military history of the Slights in Victoria come to an end, but the surname of Slight, brought to Australia by William 95 years earlier, was no longer carried by any of his many remaining descendants, including myself, who mostly hail from South Australia. What you have just seen is one story from my family's history, and while watching it, I am hoping you may have begun to think about the many, equally interesting stories in your own family's history. These two could be made into family history maps, to share your passion for family history and mapping with those around you. If you would like to learn more about family history maps and how you can make and record your own stories, I invite you to view my free e-learning video tutorial called Introduction to Family History Maps. If you're interested in making story maps, unrelated to family history, or are simply keen to see some innovative techniques for working with ArcGIS for desktop, then I hope you will take me up on my invitation too. If you have knowledge of any of the people and events that I discussed in my family history map and spot any inaccuracies or omissions, then I hope you will contact me using graham at polygeo.com.au.